Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do for you in the next few minutes is describe uh, a summary of the research that my group has carried out during the last uh, six years or so. And what I'm going to be emphasizing is research carried out at a place called Anthony Inlet uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island and several uh, fjords that are further up the coast of British Columbia. Now this looks like a small area, but this is probably about the size of Western Europe right here. So this covers a very wide uh, geographic uh, region. And we'll be looking at places that are two very different oceanographic regimes. Having a inlet is in an upwelling zone around here where waters are being influencing this area from the open ocean. Whereas these areas up here are more restricted and is more influenced by uh, continental type processes. So this is just to give a setting of the place. Having a inlet is a typical fjord environment of the west coast of Canada. You can see these uh, long, narrow uh, inlet right here. This is a, uh, a view of the inlet right here. And it's a very steep sided. These mountains right here basically go down to several hundred meters water depth. So here is the, uh, the fjord opening. There are a couple of basins that are found here. And these are what are of interest to us. And the reason for that is that this is the open ocean, is that there are sills. And these sills block the flow of water coming from the open ocean and resulting in these inner basins uh, having little oxygen circulation down to the bottom of them. So they, uh, the, the, uh, the water flow comes in like this, and then it becomes stagnant at the bottom. In this outer basin, conditions are disoxic. That means that there's very little oxygen. But in the inner basin, there's no oxygen whatsoever. And that is really nice for us, because what that means is sediment undisturbed by any animals crawling around in the bottom. So that basically year by year by year we have a very, very continuous record for several thousand years. This is a, uh, another shot, uh, but this is further north now. This is the, uh, the Seymour Lee's Inlet Complex on the, the mainland coast of British Columbia. And we're looking at several fjords that stretch, you know, several, or maybe 30 kilometers inland, and they are very restricted. There's uh, something here called the Nakwako Rapids, which basically block the main circulation of water coming in from the ocean. So it's very difficult for all the water ex to exchange on the turn of the tide. And as a result, uh, it becomes anoxic in here as well, but for very, very different reasons than we see before. And this is just a shot, again, superficially, looks very similar to what we saw in Effingham Inlet, but oceanographically very different. And these are shots of some of the equipment that we use as we take our cores. Now, everything in the Northeast Pacific, all the way from California on up into Alaska, is controlled by two, two weather systems. In the wintertime, the Aleutian Low. And the Aleutian Low is a counterclockwise gyre, of uh, atmospheric gyre, which results, brings a lot of rainfall to the coast. This is typically British Columbia, Alaska, and Northern California rain all the time in the wintertime. Uh, but it also has an impact upon circulation and results in downwell. Now, to counteract that, in the summertime, there's something called the North Pacific High develops. The North Pacific High is a clockwise gyre, but more importantly, oceanographically, or, or I should say, it makes it results in upwelling and brings much drier, sunnier conditions. When you have lots of upwelling going on, that's great for marine phytoplankton because this brings up deep water nutrients and that allows them to grow. So years when the North Pacific High is quite, uh, quite dominant, we end up with very thick layers of phytoplankton, in years when the ocean flow is more dominant, the phytoplankton layers are thinner and we end up with, with thicker mineralogic layers. And so now let's have a look. So here's a, another shot showing uh, some of the, the large cores. This is very expensive research. These ships cost $25,000 a day with a large crew. These cores here are very heavy, weigh several tons. If you, if you do not handle it correctly, somebody could become hurt or lose a finger or something like that, which happens periodically. So here's a core about to be dropped into the ocean. Uh, the, the sediment is very mucky, this stuff. Uh, so at the very surface of it, these cores are so heavy, they sometimes overshoot and go deeper into the sediment. So to get the very top of the sediment, we use something called a freeze core. And what this does is drops down to the sediment, and it's filled with dry ice. The dry ice results after about 20 minutes, all the sediment around it being frozen to it, and then you extract it, and we end up with a, a perfect record. And here's a little bit of... of uh, mud frozen at the side of that. So we get this record right up to last week, basically, when we're collecting these sediments. And here's what you end up with. Here's what this mud looks like. It's basically about 5,000 years of mud. It's not, there's not enough time here for this stuff to turn to rock or anything. So we're just looking at soft mud that has layers in it. And here's what we see. 
And I mentioned that what we see is everything here is controlled by the North Pacific High and the Aleutian Low. And so in the winter time, here are the dark layers. This is where the sediment gets washed in. And you can see, looking up through this, that no two years light. Look at this. This tells us that this was a rainier time. And I mentioned the North Pacific High is when we had upwelling and the phytoplankton loved that. Look at these thick layers right here. These are years where the diatoms loved it. And so they had thick uh, layers being laid down. Over time, change, things change. The North Pacific High may dominate for a few years in a uh, particular uh, orientation. The Aleutian Low may do it in a, for a few more years. And, these, and it forms these cycles and trends. And we scan this with a computer, and the computer can look at the thickness of the layers and can look at the changes in the darkness of the layers. And that can, the cycles and trends that the computer can recognize, we call it a time series analysis, allows us to see, is climate cyclic? Does it have any particular trends? And that's really important because, for example, uh, the, this Northeast Pacific region has only been inhabited by Europeans with thermometers uh, since really in, in, in well into the 19th century. We have no record much. And so it's very important if we want to understand climate, which often is varying on cycles longer than our lifespan, we need to look at these very complete records. And the record that we have in this region ex uh, extends back at least 5,000 years, and it's at this sort of resolution, so it's unprecedented. This is one of the highest quality climate records that are available anywhere. Because on the ships, you have to get ship time. Ship time is $25,000 a day uh, to go out on a ship, so you have to get pretty large grants in order to run that. And then we go out and also you're dealing with larger scale things. So they, there's, you actually have large crews and there's cranes have to be used to drop the cores overside and they'll, they'll get cores like 16, 17 meters long or just rolling there through the summertime and their, their, their shells fall to the bottom and stay there. Then in the winter time, it rains a lot around or you'll have snow coming off in the spring and melt and you end up with a mineral layer. Okay, so what we're looking at with these things from the, from the x-ray perspective is how thick the layers are. So if you have lots of the phytoplankton there and a thick layer like this, that tells you that it was a great year for things to grow. Okay, so if it's a thick year, so the, the, the productivity was high. And then if there's a thick mineral layer, well, that tells you there was a lot of runoff. And so that tells you it was a rainy winter in that thing. And so, and also the colors change slightly. So by looking at the scans of these cores, many, many meters long of them, we, we, we employ time series analysis programs that can look for patterns in this. And they can look at many different scales. And they look at little short patterns that flip in and out and, and see whether they're piggybacking on longer patterns. And that's how we're able to correlate with, with the recognizing solar cycles and so on. And then on top of that, we also go in and we'll take the, these same bits of mud and analyze exactly what the, the, uh, the biological makeup of them. Is. So we'll look at what sorts of fossils in there, what relative proportion, and see how they change over time and run time series analysis. And that too will tell you about how productivity and if they're responding to any sort of cycles over time. So that's the two, the, the two basic things. And then we also do geochemistry. So there's all kinds of things that we do with these cores. And it's very, very labor intensive to do this, this sort of thing. Well, the, the scanning isn't so bad. But looking at the fossils, you know, if you, you, you know we have sold thousands of years of records, but we can't, you can't look at 5,000 samples. You know, typically it's students doing this work, and they have to graduate. So they basically can only look at a few hundred samples. And so they'll look maybe at high resolution bits in, in areas of interest and look across that. And then maybe they'll do like a, a skeleton diagram where maybe they'll pick, pick years out. And so the resolution's lower, but they can still recognize uh, patterns. So that's, and we'll do that both for marine cores and the lakes. So their lakes are, you know, and the difference with the lake is that I can go out with this raft, this is what we talked about, I have these rafts basically that you go out on the lake and we have a recording devices that we deploy that basically you can just stick it down to the, the, the mud in the bottom of the, the lake somewhere and you pull it up a core meter by meter by meter. We can get the same length of core but you're extracting a bit at a time as you go down through it and we do exactly the same procedure. And the only difference is way cheaper uh, because it's just basically, uh, but even still going out on just a one-off thing like today, it's still cost you know, yeah. two or three thousand dollars because you've got to rent vehicles and there's dry ice and all this stuff. So it's cost effective usually when I go out, we'll do a whole, many of them at once and then, it's, uh, then it comes down. You, you don't spend much more to go to several different.